Released in February 1970, the Beatles' Hey Jude album was a massive success, selling millions of copies worldwide. But by the time it was released in the UK, nine years later, it had become obsolete for collectors and is today no longer officially regarded as part of the Beatles' core catalogue. But is this album still worthy of your time, or even some love? I'm Adrian from Parlogram Auctions, and welcome to the story of this. Alan Klein had met John Lennon for the first time in January 1969, and in May was handed a three-year contract to manage the Beatles. By September of that year, he had successfully renegotiated their contract with Capitol Records and had secured a significant increase in their royalties, which gave them 69 cents per album sold in America. Their new contract also included a stipulation that the Beatles provide one compilation album per year. Although still publicly together, Lennon had announced his intention to leave the group just before the Capitol deal was signed. So Klein had to work fast and get a product out before the split was officially announced and Apple ran out of money. In late November 1969, with Abbey Road riding high in the charts and the Get Back project still in limbo, Klein had an idea for an album. He instructed his associate Alan Steckler to assemble a list of Beatles songs that hadn't yet been released in the US on a Capitol album. These tracks had been omitted either because of their agreement with the United Artists, who owned the film soundtracks, or because of the Beatles' reluctance to include singles on albums. At the time of release, it was greeted enthusiastically by the public as the new Beatles album. But from today's perspective, it's a really odd record. But while there are some truly great songs on here, a number of other worthy tracks which qualified for inclusion were overlooked. Whilst Love Me Do, From Me To You and Misery were probably seen as being too old-fashioned for 1970, the omission of A Hard Day's Night, I'm Down and The Inner Light is more puzzling. Another obvious candidate for inclusion was Get Back, but that was presumably held back for the next album. Also, the inclusion of Don't Let Me Down on this album may have been responsible for its submission on Let It Be. Surely one of the above tracks could have been included. After all, the released album only contained 10 tracks, one less even than Capitol's early albums. But that wasn't the point. This album wasn't meant to be a gift for fans or even an artistic statement. It was designed purely to make money. For once, some proper tape research was done and Steckler made sure he acquired all the correct stereo mixes. Unlike Capitol's lazy attitude to the stereo mixes on Magical Mystery Tour, Steckler had George Martin prepare new and true stereo mixes for Rain, Lady Madonna, Revolution and Hey Jude. The tape was then taken not to Capitol for mastering, but to the independent Bell Sound Studios in New York, where it was mastered by their ace-cutting engineer Sam Feldman. Although track selection had been a tough job, finding a title for the album proved just as challenging. The first choice was the rather uninspiring The Beatles Again, and it was this which appeared on the labels of early first pressings. At least three prototype covers were produced, some of which included The Beatles Again title. But just as the album was going to press, they changed the name to Hey Jude. It was decided to leave the title off of the album completely although early copies came with unmissable stickers on the front panel in various sizes. Some early covers had the Beatles again printed on the spine, and some had different prefixes to their catalogue number. This SO prefix denoted a full price album, which should retail at $6.98. That price code was quickly changed to SW, and the album ended up retailing for the cheaper price of $5.98. The order of the tracks listed on the rear panel is not as they appear on the record. 
Was this the album's original running order or just a random piece of design? In 2007, Neil Aspinall claimed that the back cover was supposed to have been the front cover and vice versa, but the Klein had reversed them in error. The cover images themselves were both taken during the Beatles' final photo shoot at Lennon's Tiddenhurst Park home on August 22, 1969. The front cover photo was taken in the doorway of the property's Victorian Assembly Hall. The stone bust to the right of Lennon's foot ended up in Ringo's collection, and he later sold it at auction in 2015, where it fetched $35,000. The Hey Jude album was released on February 26, 1970, in the US and many other countries around the world. And here are a few of those. Did you notice what was missing from that final Spanish Side 2 label? Well, it was The Ballad of John and Yoko. The Ballad of John and Yoko had, due to the use of the word Christ in the lyrics, already caused controversy in both the UK and the US. Some radio stations had edited out the offending word, or even gone as far as banning the song completely. But although being a staunchly Catholic country, it wasn't the word Christ which offended the Spanish censors. It was Gibraltar. On the day the single was released, May the 30th, 1969, the UK, following the result of a referendum in September 1967, granted internal autonomy to the island of Gibraltar. Spain's dictatorship, led by General Franco, retaliated a week later on June the 8th by closing the border between Spain and Gibraltar. Lennon's reference to getting married in Gibraltar near Spain had hit a raw nerve with Franco, and he ordered that the track be banned and deleted from the album. Therefore, all Spanish copies have just three tracks on side two, which ends with Don't Let Me Down. It was also omitted from the Spanish pressing of 1967-70, three years later. Despite Abbey Road still riding high in the charts, Hey Jude sold extremely well. It stayed at number two for four weeks, and was held off the top of the Billboard chart by Bridge Over Troubled Water. It remained in the top 10 for 11 weeks, selling a million in its first month, and eventually over 3.3 million in total. Over in the UK, EMI carried on a tradition that had begun with Magical Mystery Tour in 1967, by completely ignoring the album. One can only assume that the non-appearance of this album in the UK was contractual, but EMI did press up copies in the Hayes factory, but those were for export only. In fact, EMI provided the tapes or even the stampers for many of the pressings in other countries around the world, which can be identified by their YEEX matrices. That same master was also used to produce the now highly sought after domestically produced export copies. The rarest and most valuable of which appeared in 1970, on the one EMI box parlophone label with the catalogue number PCPCS106. This was produced either at EMI's Hayes factory or by license in other countries where the Apple label was still not a registered trademark, such as in the West Indies, for example. This was followed by CPCS106, which was pressed on the dark green Apple label, mainly for export to Scandinavia. Some of these early dark green Apple labels contain a spelling error where revolution is misspelled as revolutions. They also have a typesetting error which separates the words paper and back on paperback writer, which occurred on a lot of other countries' labels too. 
These errors were corrected for the 1973 repressing on the lighter green apple labels, copies of which did sometimes turn up in UK stores and were available as special orders. EMI finally and without fanfare released it domestically in the UK on May the 11th, 1979 as PCS 7184, nine years after its first release. The same amount of time, in fact, it had taken them to release the Magical Mystery Tour album on vinyl. The album carries a Harry Moss recut and has regular YEX matrices. Its release went virtually unnoticed by the British public and it didn't even chart, which is understandable as its content had been made obsolete back in 1973 by the Red and the Blue albums. In fact, the only reason to buy this album in 1979 was to get the stereo mix of Rain. And that's the problem with this album. Unless you're a collector, completist, or someone who bought it when it first came out, there is on the face of it no reason to own this album today. From a neutral's perspective, it's a real hodgepodge of an album, with its odd mix of early era songs colliding with late era songs. And it lacks any continuity or cohesion as an album. As far as compilations go, I think a collection of Beatles oldies is better. Now it wouldn't be a parlogram video without checking out the sound quality. So let's take care of that right now. Now to give this album a fair hearing, I've collected six different pressings to compare. First is a US 1970 Winchester pressing. Second is this 1971 UK export pressing on the dark green Apple label. Next is a German first pressing with A-1, B-1 matrices. Then a German second pressing with A-2, B-2 cuttings. The fifth is also a German pressing. This copy was marked for export to Switzerland and it has A-3, B-3 matrices. And finally, a UK 1979 pressing on Parlophone. Now, unlike a lot of original US albums I've heard, this is a really good sounding disc. It's got an honest, straight down the middle kind of sound. It's forward and punchy, with no extremes high or low. The only issue I can find is the early fade at the end of the Ballad of John and Yoko, where the final drum beat is almost lost. The 1971 UK export pressing, on the other hand, is a completely different sounding album. It has a more moderate tone, with a richer, deeper bass and a smoother high end. It's a true audiophile pressing. The German first pressing is again totally different. They appear to have made up this album using tapes from their own library, with the one major difference being Paperback Writer, which is in mono. Side one of this pressing is very clean and clear, but like other German Apple albums of this time, it's quite bass shy. Side two would also have been good, if it hadn't been cut at a lower volume. The bass side of things improve on the German A2B2, which now includes a stereo version of Paperback Writer. But everything really comes together on the A3B3, where a smooth, clean high end matches a rich open bass sound, and it rivals the UK export pressing for detail. The 1979 Parlophone is very close to the 1971 Apple export, but with a slightly muddy bass. But it's still a great sounding album overall, and maybe more importantly, easier to find and less expensive. Like a collection of oldies, this album was overlooked for transfer onto CD in 1987. However, it did get an official release on CD in 2014, but only as part of the US album's box set. But if you've got the 2009 CDs, you might as well make your own, because this CD just uses those mixes but you do get the full drum beat at the end of the Ballad of John and Yoko. But what do you think about this album and what are your memories? Do you still play it today? Whatever you think about it, let me and everyone else know in the comments. I'll be back shortly with video number 100 on the channel, but that's all for this time. So I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.